I can't say, okay, you murdered 13 people. All right, we can't prove it. All right, you robbed 17 banks. Okay, we can't prove it. But what we can prove is that your ass ain't paid your taxes or... love bugs. Hello, Bellas. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook and or Twitter and subscribe because it is so important to my success here on the YouTube. And if you are not already a part of our Bella Book Club, please remember to hit the Patreon link below or the join button here on YouTube and be privy to all the shenanigans first. Now let's talk about David Ricks, uh, Respect, The Life of Aretha Franklin, part, oh, I think this is a 13 or 14. Where we yeah. left you off. Aretha is in the studio working on her uh, second album. Okay, now this is after she fell off the stage from being old drunk, drunky pup. Okay, and she tried to tell the people's, oh, the light was blinding me and I fell off the stage. And I said, oh, you was drunk as shit, Riri. But anyway, they at the studio. Her arm a little funny because she broke her elbow. You know, she is the pianist. And she was able to accomplish some songs with that jacked up elbow, but for the ones that she could not, you know, she would get help from somebody else in the studio with her. But for the most part, Aretha got it done. Aretha yeah. had decided to call in the Sweet Inspirations led by Sissy Houston. Now dig this, Sissy Houston had already sang on two of Aretha Franklin's song. One of them was Never Loved a Man. Now we know that, that high pitched songbird thing, or oh, that's Sissy. Sissy, I didn't know that you was capable of that, girl. But then when I think about it, if you was able to push your daughter to that range too, why wouldn't I think that you would be capable of that range? But what Wexler said was that Riri and Sissy had the same uh, background. OK, that they both had that gritty gospel music uh, judge about them, you know, and Jerry Wexler also gave accolades to the other sweet inspirations. That would be Estelle Brown and Sylvia, uh, Sylvia Shamel and Myrna Smith. He said that all four of them together was harmonious. Wexler came happened. from a poor background, okay? And him coming from a poor background, he really didn't know what money was, okay? So he had convinced the brothers, because I told y'all, sometimes he say his, you know, he just speak of that one partner, but he said that uh, in this deal, he had to convince the brothers, what were his names mean? were Etigan, Okay, and he had convinced them to sell Atlantic for 17.5 million to Warner Brothers. Now, the reason why he was so eager to sell was because, like I said, he didn't have no uh, really experience with money. So he thought that that 17.5 was enough. Answer no, because he reflected back and he said that uh, if he would have waited longer, he could have quadrupled the amount that he got for um, Atlantic. Because of Aretha, his company was doing exceptionally well financially, okay? And he jumped out there. But like I said, he reflected back and he said he was a fool. And he will always consider that a devastating event in his so life. The second devastating event that Wexler recalls is the last day that Aretha Franklin was in the studio on her second album. The same day, July 23rd, 
the Detroit 12th Street riots broke out. Cecil's wife, Erlene, speaks on the situation and says that she was devastated. She was terrified, okay? She was actually back home in Detroit by herself. Cecil had gone to New York because Reed was fighting so bad with Ted that the brother needed to intervene. You know how that is sometimes. I told y'all, Riri is sick of his ass. You know, at first, uh, you know, you'll be like, no, Cecil, don't hit him, don't hit him. Then after a while, you be like, Cecil, come dog this nigga. Um, Fuck his ass. Cecil was gone, okay? Um, Carolyn and Irma were also out of town. So it was just him or it's just her, okay? When she called Cecil, after seeing all this stuff burning and looting and everything, Cecil told her, I need you to get to a safe place. The safe place would be at Reverend C.L. Smooth's house. He said when okay. she got to Reverend C.L. Smooth's house, the phone was ringing off the hook, of course, because his children is trying to figure out, is their pappy safe, okay? Because although, like I said previously before, they may have their issues, you know, between each other. But in a devastating event, oh, they got each other's back. And that's how just families are, okay? We can call, you know, our aunt a drunk. We can call our uncle a pipehead. But bitch, don't let none of y'all outside of this family say, uh, yeah, pipehead Clarence, you know, drunk ass Shirley, you know, dick sucking, you know, Tammy. We can call her that. But bitch, you can When she got to the house, CL Smooth was calm, cool, and collected. And for all you hoes that be like, why you call him CL Smoothie? Okay, the Bellas and the Love Bugs know why I call him that, okay? But just in case you dum dums don't know, I call him CL Smoothie because that motherfucker is smooth. Hence what I'm about to say, okay? Earlene said that uh, CL Smoothie remained calm in a situation. He seemed unbothered. You know why? Because he is the patriarch and he has to show that pillar of strength. He can't show weakness. So once the siblings talk to each other, um, they um, realized that their dad was just fine and he was okay. Everything was cool, okay? All the siblings except for Aretha, right? So Cecil talks about how when he was up there with uh, Aretha in New York, she was inconsolable. One, because she was drunk as shit, okay? Two, because she was in bad shape as a result of the relationship between her and Ted. And three, she knew that the peoples was after her father. Now, keep in mind, right now, her father is a civil rights leader, despite his past, okay? Hey, they, hey, I'm just going to leave that right there, okay? You know what the government do, okay? If they can't get you no other way, oh, they will smack you in the face with the taxes. You hear me? I don't get, the tax man will find a fucking way to get your ass. You hear me? Oh, I can't say, okay, you murdered 13 people. All right, we can't prove it. All right, you robbed 17 banks. Okay, we can't prove it. But what we can prove is that your ass ain't paid your taxes or you ain't paid them appropriately for these years. Some claim that CL Smooth failed to report over 75000 in income in the years 1959 through 1962. Again, everybody's looking around like, what? My pop's been in business for, uh, you know, like 20 years, bruh. Why all of a sudden now you looking for shit? C.L. Smooth actually wrote President Lyndon Johnson. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he argued that he didn't realize that cash gifts from his congregation was considered income. Okay. The president didn't respond. In 1967, Franklin pleaded no contest and was fined at 2,500 and put on probation. Really? You gonna put one of our leaders on probation for some bullshit and you got Trumpity Trump around here, not only not paying his taxes, but he getting like billion dollar, you know, uh, refunds and you fucking with us 
And that nigga Trump ain't paid taxes in fucking years. Cecil recalls a conversation that he had with his father after the event. Children, don't worry about it, okay? This is just one of the consequences for leadership or of leadership. This is one of the consequences for my affiliation with Dr. King. And I have accepted it. Uh, okay, okay, it's the summer, right? And Baby I Love You is certified gold. Aretha's third million seller single, okay? Now, this is the situation between Aretha and Dr. King. OK, Aretha is traveling, doing her own thing. Right. But she has dedicated herself to supporting Dr. King, no matter what. If he calls, she's there. Except for that one time that they asked Irma Franklin to 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 sing at an event. And Aretha was like, fuck that event. You already got a Franklin. You don't need me to. You know, she was being patty. OK, but every time Dr. King called. She was there. Despite how tired she was, despite what she was going through, it, it didn't matter. Her purpose was greater than just to sing. She, need, she knew that her voice was a vehicle to reach the people during time of civil unrest. Now, let me insert this, right? I might be joking about Aretha Franklin being old junkie poo, but let me tell you, okay, I have so much respect for this woman. OK, and her craft and her commitment to the civil rights movement, Dr. King, her father, um, you know, her marriage, her career. You know, I, I, I really hope when they do the movie that they do the David Ritz rendition. OK, because everybody said that or all the people in the book that I'm reading says that Aretha Franklin is very, very private. She never really talks about, you know, the things that are most painful to her. She don't want to show weakness, but the fact that she is enduring all, right? So I talk about that to lead up to this, okay? Jerry Wexler recalls a time where Riri would call him. She would say, Jerry, I don't think I can make these particular gigs. Jerry, being the per the understanding person for the three reasons that I mentioned earlier, would say, okay, we can take care of that and let's just put the studio sessions on hold. He said, Riri will be like, oh, no, no, no. Don't put my studio sessions on hold because Carlin just wrote me a banger, okay? And I need to get in there so we can do it, okay? Jerry Wexler was like, are you sure? She said, hell yeah, I'm sure. I ain't never going to stop singing and recording. That's never going to happen because I see that as her way to release her pain. So the album titled Lady Soul was recorded in 1967 and released in early 1968. Lady Soul had held hits like uh, Chain of Fools, A Natural Woman, Since You've Been Gone, and my, oh, one of my most favorite songs by Aretha, Ain't No Way, okay? Oh. Now, so a week later, Jet ran a picture of Aretha taking a call from a fan while the injury prone star was attended by a nurse in Detroit's Daily Hospital. The result of an eye injury suffered in a fall, okay? That, Wexler said that ended in a series of canceled dates, okay? And actually, Wexler said that she would show up to the studio like that often. People were kind of used to seeing her like that, bruised. And they would all just attribute it to Aretha Franklin being accident prone. So Wexler recalls during the recording sessions of the Lady Soul album, okay? He said Aretha Franklin was already dealing with her own um, issues mentally and physically, you know, as a result of her drinking and her failing marriage, okay? But what added on top of Aretha Franklin's sorrows was on December 10th, 1967, she lost an old friend, Otis Redding. He was only 26 years old when he died in that plane crash. Because Otis Redding and Aretha Franklin were old friends, um, 
Dre Wexler asked her, do you want to come? Because they've asked me to speak at his memorial down there in Macon. Okay. Aretha said, no, I want to stay here, but please send my regards. And as soon as you get back, tell me every inch of what happened. Okay. Wexler said that the ceremony was beautiful. So it was the sad. sole royalty that attended the service was uh, Joe Simon, Johnny Taylor, James Brown, Wilson Pickett, Isaac Hayes, Joe Tex, Arthur Conley, and Simon Burke. Oh, and Don Convoy. Both of Aretha Franklin's sisters, Irma and uh, Carolyn, both said that Lady Soul was their favorite album. Carolyn said it wasn't just because she wrote Ain't No Way. Ooh, that ain't no way. She wrote a couple of other songs too on the album, and so did Aretha. But she said it was her favorite album because she felt that it was a sign of release for her sister. She was releasing her soul into this album. She was creating something that was the sign of the times and at the same time, the sign of her life. Despite now, despite all, Aretha Franklin considered the end of 1967 the biggest year of her career, okay? With Teddy Pimpy Whitey at her fucking right. side. You know, uh, listen, I would do shit to Ted Pimpy Whitey, okay? I would gaslight the fuck out of him. Do you hear me? Is that gaslighting when you make somebody think they crazy? You know, do crazy shit, like put, you know, baby oil in his face cream, you know, uh, hair removal in his perm, okay? Stuff like that. I would do shit to him, okay? Because you ain't gonna just be putting your hands on me and getting away anyway, with it. The sister said it didn't matter. None of it mattered because Riri was scared to let him go. Somehow she connected, she connected Teddy Pimpy Whitey with success. At the end of 1967, Ruth Bowman thought that Aretha Franklin was going to have a nervous breakdown between the recording, the gigs, the drinking, uh, the television shows, Dr. King on her neck asking her, uh, can you help me at this situation right now? Here? If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook and subscribe. And remember this. The same people that you meet on the way up will always be the same people that you meet on the way down. My naysayers, my patron loves babies. You have a good one. Peace.